Let's talk about architectural view. So, software, or at least interesting software, projects that are large, new, and work on interesting concepts tend to be complex. That anything that has interesting behavior tends to have complex structure to deliver that behavior. So consequently, there's many aspects to the design of its architecture. It's not just a simple, oh, well, there's this thing that executes and there's a few classes that do these things and that's it. That there could be thousands of classes. There could be dozens of things that execute on different uh, hardware components. And that makes our system complex. And there's all sorts of things to consider in the design of its architecture. So designing the architecture itself is all around managing the complexity of that architecture, figuring out how can you structure a system so that you can deliver functionality, deliver the quality attributes, and still have something that's manageable and maintainable, and designing how you break it up into parts that make sense and are usable, and which actually can work together. So the architecture itself starts to become complex. So what we're interested in from a views perspective is saying, well, how do I describe this complex architecture that obviously people need to understand it because they're going to have to build it and they're going to have to extend it and they're going to have to maintain it. So how do we describe the architecture of a complex system without making the description so complex that no one knows what it actually does. So that's where views comes in. Architectural views are a mechanism for focusing on only one part of the system on one aspect of the system at any particular time. And so you can start looking at it and you don't need to understand the entire thing. You can say, well, just consider this part of the system. Just tell me the basic overall structure. What are the major sections of the system and how do they communicate? Or for a particular section, what happens internally in that section? Or I'm not so much interested in the structure as I'm interested in the communication and the actual behavior that's delivered through the system. Um, and eventually we need to consider the actual physical architecture and the infrastructure on which my software is going to be executing. So instead of trying to describe that all at once, we describe it part by part so it's easier to understand and it becomes more manageable in trying to figure out how the overall system works and then the details of particular parts of the system. So there are architectural views. There's actually quite a number of different perspectives or opinions about what views are important. Um, so you should be aware that there are different types of architectural views around and someone may talk about these and be talking about things using a terminology you're not familiar with. So you need to be able to translate between views and say, ah, oh, what you mean is this. So one of the early architectural views and description of the whole idea of architectural views was by Philippe Cruchen and he developed what he calls the four plus one views. So it's the four are logical process development and physical views. And so they're looking at the structure of your actual architecture. So that's what they're focusing on is the four views. And so logical is literally that, it's the logical structure of your system. The process is looking at the way that the system behaves and the processes that are executing. It, development is the focusing more so on the actual development side of it. How do we actually build this thing? And physical is then your actual physical architecture. The last view or the plus one is what he calls the scenario view, or it's sometimes called the use case view, because it's not so much about the architecture as it's the 
functionality that the architecture delivers. And so it's talking about what are the key scenarios that describe the most important aspects of the functionality of the system. And so we then use that as a mechanism to essentially consider the other four views. There's the textbook Software Architecture and Practice by Bass et al. And they have three views, module, component, and connector, and allocation. And so in their perspective of views, they're looking at things and saying, OK, well, structure is really important. And you'll find this in all architectural views. There is something that focuses on the actual structure of the software. So that's the module view. Component and connector is then the behavioral view. So how do the parts of your architecture connect to each other? and how do they communicate with each other. And then the allocation view is looking at the idea of how do I actually allocate these resources. Now, interesting with them, allocate is quite a broad term. So it's not just your physical architecture. It's not just allocating software to run on different hardware infrastructure. Um, allocation also considers things like, where do I store these files? Um, so some of these things are sort of considerations for very large systems. So if I have thousands of developers working in different companies, working on different parts of the system, they actually may all use different repositories where they're storing stuff. And you need to actually get your head around where everything is to actually build the overall system and make sure it's coherent. Uh, similarly, the allocation considers things like who's going to work on which parts of the system. Um, so for small systems and teams, typically you just work that out as you're working on the project. But for very large projects with thousands of developers, yeah, you do actually need to know not literally what every single person is doing, but what teams are responsible for which parts of the system. Uh, Rosansky and Woods is another relatively common approach. So they have a textbook about software architecture and views. And so they have um, four views. Um, I'm actually personally biased towards this one, even though we don't mention it in the readings. But they talk about the context of your system. And so thinking about that high level view of the overall system, its context, and a little bit about how it's used. Um, then talking about the building blocks, so your structure of your system and how you actually build the software architecture and how it's all connected together. The runtime view, so that more dynamic behavioral perspective of how do the parts communicate. And the deployment view, which is then the how do I deploy the software onto the computing and hardware infrastructure. Um, NATO actually has a relatively useful um, document about software architecture, that is, which is the NATO Architecture Framework, or NAF. And they have a set of views, which they call concept, service, logical, physical resource, and architecture foundation. And so this is, again, their way of partitioning large complex systems into understandable components. So concepts is that, again, sort of higher level view, sort of similar to context and some ideas of the scenario view. So it's what are the concepts that this system is supposed to uh, encapsulate? Service is the services that are going to be provided. And so there's a heavy bias here to thinking about, again, very large systems that are typically composed of other systems. So you start thinking about the interfaces between systems, and services they deliver. And we come back to that logical idea of your actual logical structure of the architecture, um, your physical resources, which is your actual physical architecture. How are we deploying things? And then the architectural foundation is looking at it from the perspective of for very large systems, there tends to be some software infrastructure that you're using as well as hardware infrastructure. So what is that software infrastructure? And so things like um, communication protocols um, or message queues or other mechanisms for working with these systems. And there's others, we're not going to go through every single one because I probably couldn't find them all anyways. Um, two things to be aware of is TOGAF and ISO 42010. So TOGAF is the Open Group Architecture Framework. 
So the open group has literally what the name implies, that they are a um, group of people who have sort of um, not literally open source, but open um, material about software development. And they have an architecture framework sort of giving advice about how to build architectures. Now, TOGAF, they have a lot of words about views, but I don't actually advocate any particular ones. They just say views are really important. Figure out which ones are important for your system. Um, ISO 42010 is literally an international standard. It was originally developed by the IEEE Computer Society. Um, so it's a standard about software architecture, and so it has a fair bit to say about views and what they also talk about with viewpoints. And so viewpoints is a phrase you should be at least vaguely aware of. So if someone mentioned it, you don't sort of look blankly at them. But the idea of a viewpoint is who is interested in the view. So when you partition your documentation for a system up into views, you then consider who's actually going to be interested in reading about particular views and then make sure you tailor the documentation for those who are reading it. So <clears throat> those are some things to be aware of. We're not going to go through all of them in detail because it's really, you should be aware that there's many out there. You can go pick up specific ones as necessary. We're going to mention a little bit more about the 4 plus 1 views, um, primarily because if you start searching for architectural views online, you'll find the 4 plus 1 comes up over and over and over and over again. And it's used in many textbooks and courses. So it's something you should be aware of. And it's had a heavy influence on most of the others because it was one of the early ones and one of the better ones out of the number that are out there anyways. So he said the logical view was the structure. So it's focusing on how you're actually going to implement your architecture. So the focus is on the actual things that make up your software system. So components or classes um, or functions depends on the actual language and tools you're using to build the system. But we're looking at what are the actual parts that make up the thing? What are the actual code structures that you need? So for example, we're going to have a bunch of classes to implement our system. So what are those classes? How do they work together? What are their relationships? And also what are their interactions? So relationships is how these parts or components or classes are connected together. Interactions is then looking at more the dynamic view of, okay, so if class A uses class B, how does it use it? Oh, well, it sends these messages to class an object of class B. So relationships is the connection between classes or components. Interactions is what actually happens. How does that actually play out to deliver behavior? And so from a UML perspective, you're looking at class diagrams as one of the key components of your logical structure and having different class diagrams for different parts of the system. And so that gives you your classes and relationships. You can have component diagrams or components within class diagrams and their relationships. You have interfaces to manage relationships. And then you have interactions through sequence and communication diagrams describing the interactive behavior of the system. The process we said is dynamic behavior. So what do we mean if the logical already has descriptions of behavior. So from Philippe's perspective, four plus one views is considering the more interesting aspects of the dynamic behavior from the larger overall perspective of the architecture. So this is things like concurrency and distribution. So what parts of the system are running concurrently with other parts? Uh, which parts are actually running on separate processes and you've now got a distributed system and how do they then communicate? So it's dynamic behavior at sort of a higher level than the detail of how objects interact to deliver behavior. It's now how processes and threads interact to deliver complex behavior. And so that then introduces things like, well, how do I control all these processes? 
what's my concurrency model? How do I actually ensure that I've got a thread safe system? How do I ensure that I don't have processes locking or blocking each other? So I need to consider these behaviors in design of large complex systems. And then there also leads into fault tolerance, which is particularly important for distributed systems because if I've got things work executing on different computing platforms, what happens if I send a message to something on a different hardware platform and I don't get a response? So fault tolerance is how do I manage the faults that are going to creep into large complex systems and distribution is just, well, rife with all sorts of interesting faults that you then have to design to cater for and manage. Development is then looking at it from the perspective of the developers. So how do we organize how this system is going to be structured so we can actually build it? So again, this is something typically more important for a large complex team or teams that have people distributed across multiple sites or even teams that are working across different organizations. And so you then need to think about the idea of how do we actually manage the software in an organizational perspective. So again, it comes down to things like we mentioned with Bacidel, that where is it stored? Who's responsible for which repositories? And horrifyingly, what do we do with the fact that we have these people using SVN, those people using Mercurial, and we're using Git, and we've got to merge it all together at some stage. So. Those are some of the things that come out with the development view. Um, Philippe also talks about the idea that um, this will also consider the teams that are responsible for different um, structures within the system and who is going to implement which parts of the system. Physical view is then literally the physical architecture. So what do we need to worry about? in terms of actually executing the system. So it's looking at what hardware infrastructure is required and what software is going to run on which bits of hardware. And so a focus here is on delivering your non-functional requirements. And so some of the non-functional requirements or quality attributes you're going to consider are things like availability, reliability, scalability, throughput, and anything else that comes down to what happens if parts of your system fall over or what happens if parts of your system get overloaded and so this is where you not just sort of say ah i need these different servers i'm going to have this software running on these different servers but start talking about well okay how do we actually distribute load between um, redundant servers and how do we actually deal with scalability do we have some mechanism for starting up new servers as existing servers start to get loaded. How do we deal with reliability in dealing with if some particular hardware infrastructure fails? Um, so this is all around the physical architecture. What do I need to worry about in terms of the hardware itself and ensuring it's able to execute the software in the manner we expect it to behave according to our non-functional requirements? And just a comment about the non-functional requirements that the dynamic behavior also has a fairly heavy emphasis on non-functional requirements. Um, fault tolerance probably should have hinted at that. But we're then looking at non-functional and quality, non-functional requirements, quality attributes related to the behavior of the software. And so this is where things like um, fault tolerance, um, fail safety or fail safely or um, always ending in a safe state or in a secure state are issues that are part of your dynamic behavior to consider. And then we said the scenario view was describing functionality. And so we're not describing the entire set of functionality for the system. It's the key functionality that demonstrates what the system's purpose is. And so the Sir Philippe's more modern take on this is that you use use cases 
Um, we've got a reference to his original article in these slides and in the notes, and he's there in that article talks about um, describing scenarios using something called the Booch notation. Um, he sort of moved on from there because that was practically 30 years ago. And so the idea is now you would start typically using use cases to describe functionality, and then you'd identify the key use cases that are the drivers for the architecture. And then you would provide detailed descriptions for those use cases as either um, textual descriptions or possibly activity diagrams where you describe the behavior. And so we then use those use cases in three just different ways. So initially is you're building the architecture. So you use those use cases saying, this is the key thing the system has to deliver. So let's use those ideas as the key drivers for designing the architecture. So you ensure that your architecture can deliver the functionality described by those key use cases. And then the next bit is now that you've got a architecture in place, you then test it. So you validate the design of your architecture based on those use cases. You also are going to be validating it against your non-functional requirements. But from the scenario perspective, it's the validating that your architecture actually delivers on the requirements before you actually get too far into building the entire system. And then lastly, it's a documentation perspective in that we leave these scenarios and use cases in the documentation for the system because they then give people who come to the system later an idea of why the architecture is structured the way it is. So it provides an illustration of how the system is meant to be used, which then should provide ideas about why the architecture is structured the way it is. So four plus one views, as I said, commonly used, um, lots of material online about it. Um, lots of different variations on what people think it actually means. Um, so in the reading, I mentioned that these ideas came out of Philippe Cruchen's experience building a very massive um, air traffic control system. So it's air traffic control system that manages the entire Canadian airspace, which is vast. So the airspace, Australia's airspace is quite vast because it includes basically from here to Antarctica and across to South America. Um, but the Canadian airspace is vast because it includes basically the top quarter of the world. So it's a lot of space, lots of different air traffic control towers that manage different parts of the space. And so he was building a very complex system. And so he needed a way of describing it so that everyone understood. So he had himself and two others who designed the entire architecture for the system. And then they had the Mongolian hordes, well, actually the Canadian hordes of 2,500 developers to actually build the system. So they had to then build it to fit with the architecture. And as mentioned in the notes, they managed to do it on time and on budget, unlike most projects. So we've been talking about views. Views implies that we can actually see something. So typically we describe views using diagrams. Um, not just diagrams, typically there's some textual description to go with them, but diagrams are really useful in helping people visualize the architecture. So we want to make sure we use diagrams that clearly express our ideas and not just have, oh, here is machine generated. I threw it all into IntelliJ and it spat out this massive class diagram that's completely unreadable. So you need to ensure that your architectural diagrams convey the information you want. And there are different types of diagrams available. 
in different types of notation. So in terms of notation, there are a number of notations around. Probably the only two that are worth worrying about are UML and C4. Um, so UML is a standardized language for describing object-oriented systems. Um, there is a formal specification that defines UML, which means that it's well-structured, well-defined. There's a rule for everything. Oh, drawback is there's a rule for everything. It's really easy to make invalid UML diagrams because it's really easy to break the rules. Um, it's really difficult to know all the rules. Part of the reason why people don't like UML is it's too well defined. Um, but if you either A, need the formality, then it's there. And you can actually take advantage of that formality because you can then say, well, if there's a formal description in UML, I can actually use that to generate code. I can actually use that to generate dynamic prototypes. Um, and there's companies here in Brisbane that do this, that they'll come up with very um, complete detailed UML diagrams for their systems and then generate the system. And one of those companies is Working Mouse and they'll claim that that will generate about 96% of the code for their system. And the last little bit is the last little bit of hand tweaking in code, and then it's done. So UML, formality is useful. If I'm building something where I might be sued, a formal description could be useful to say, see, I said it was right. Um, also, formality means that, yeah, it can generate code for you and also generate documentation for you. Um, but a lot of people who use UML sort of skip all the formality and just say, well, everyone knows what a class diagram looks like. So we'll ignore the fine details and just use the simple parts of UML to describe things, which is a valid approach for less um, formal or less critical systems. C4 is another notation that's gained popularity in the last five or so years. Um, it's popular primarily because it's simple, and it's simple because it's informal. That it's a fairly simple set of <clears throat> diagrams with fairly few parts to each diagram and very simple relationships between the parts. So there's no formality defining all the fine rules about how it works because that's not the purpose. The purpose is to have a simple way of sketching out a architectural diagram and describing key things in a way everyone understands without having to worry about getting all the rules correct. So C4 has become popular because it's simple and informal. And so in situations where you are building something that's not so critical and not so large, or you don't want to do code generation, then you can use C4. Um, C4 also has um, some nice tools around that if you've actually got software, you can then generate C4 diagrams from the software. Um, does require that you either do extensive editing of those diagrams or that you annotate your code correctly to generate good diagrams. Because like UML, you auto-generate something just based on simple code. Both UML and C4 come up with messes. So I've mentioned the notes. So there is a reading on architectural views, which is reasonably detailed and goes into this in detail. And it provides um, and, well, descriptions of particularly the software architecture and practice views in some detail. And it also provides a detailed UML example for a system saying, here is an example of building a architecture using UML following the software architecture and practice views. And then there's an example of the same system using C4. And that one's actually more following Rosinski's approach, um, but it's still giving you two different ways of viewing the architecture. 
And so this all becomes really important because you have an assignment to describe an architecture of a system. And so you're going to need to have diagrams to describe that architecture. You need a way of focusing on different parts of the architecture and thinking about it logically. And so you should be considering which views are important for your architecture. And the last thing to comment about views is that you don't need to use all the views all the time. So particularly with the um, NAF, the NATO architecture framework, and to an extent with Philippe Kuchin's 4 plus 1 views, there's aspects of those which are related to dealing with very large systems. If you're not dealing with a very large system, then you don't need to use those parts of the views. And so there's some views that just aren't necessary. So if you don't have any concurrency and distribution in your system, then you don't need to have any view about that. Um, if you don't have complex teams working on it, you don't need to worry about file structures and team allocation. <clears throat> so you need to think about which views and even which parts of views are relevant and important for your particular architecture. So references should not read them all, but they're there for you to take advantage of to look at these in a little more detail and to consider particular views at particular points in time. Okay, so that was our introduction to architectural views. And the key thing to note here is you need to read the notes because there's a lot more detail in there and I don't have four hours to give a lecture on all of that detail. <clears throat>